Solomon, Suleiman, which is how some of the slaves tried to deal with their names. We'll deal with that in, in, in a few minutes. Job ben Solomon. He was praying one day. He was working out in the, uh, he was working out in the, um, like, um, shepherd. And he liked doing that because he could pray. So one day a little, a little, a, a boy, a little white boy came up to him and, and, and kicked dirt in his face while he was praying. So he had enough. He ran away. When he got up north and they interrogated him, he couldn't speak English. He said two words to him. Allah Muhammad. Allah Muhammad. Ayub even uh, Suleiman eventually went back to Africa. Even on the boat from Maryland to London, he told them, I gotta eat, you know, I mean, halal, halal. They, the people on the boat let him kill his own chicken so that it could be halal. Ayub bin, uh, ibn Suleiman. Yaru Mahmoud, um, a popular, you'll see his uh, picture in the thing. Um, Yaru Mahmoud, a, a Muslim here, he prayed in public. He prayed in public. And you never seen him without something covering his head. He always looked like Islamic. But he prayed in public, and there's records of his slave, slave holder talking about him, how him chanting about Allah in the streets. He used to chant, they say he used to chant about Allah in the streets, right? He prayed in public. The women, accounts traveling throughout Brazil. The sisters, long, bright colored shawls that uh, like came over, like covered their bosom, like the khimar, like the khimar, right? Um, veils, as we said, but they looked identical to Muslim Africans, identical to Muslim Africans with what they had. It was identical to Muslim Africans. So brothers and sisters, the Muslim Africans wanted to stay Muslims. They wanted to stay Muslims. And when they, they wanted to distinctly look like Muslims during slavery. We want to look like Muslims. We're not going to be humiliated. We're not going to be degraded. The type of clothes that we will wear will reflect our religion. So of course, they became more visible to each other. The names. The Prophet ﷺ said, give your children good names. A, per a person takes on the, uh, you know, the characteristics of their names. That's, the, that's how it is, brothers and sisters. That's why when the Prophet peace be upon him saw this girl and he said, what is your name? And she said a name that meant um, disobedient. He said, no, 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 no. Your name shall be Jamila, which means good and beautiful. But she had a name that was negative. The Prophet peace be upon him said, give your children good names. They will take on the characteristics of their names. So now, based on that prophetic statement, brothers and sisters, what type of characteristics will we take on walking around here with slave names? What type of characteristics do we take on walking around here with slave names? Ralph's didn't come from Africa. Billy Bob and Smith and Johnson didn't come from Africa, right? We're walking around here, many of us, with slave names. Names that speak of a heritage. What type of heritage? A slave heritage. At one point in time, my great-great-grandfather owned your great-great-grandfather. That's what that name means. That's the heritage behind the slave name. So of course, the first process that happened when the Africans were brought over here was we got to change their names. We got to change their names. The Muslims, brothers and sisters, understood that by changing their names, it annihilated their past. By changing their names, it, it annihilated their sense of self. By changing their names, it annihilated their culture, their kinship. By changing their names, it, it just totally wiped out their, their ethnic origin. It, it wiped out their religion just by changing that name. The African Muslims understood that. The African Muslims dealt with that in different ways. They tried to keep their names in different ways. One, sometimes they would answer the two names. Outside world, they're Johnson or Toby. Among the community, they're Muhammad or Bilal. So in many instances, what would happen is that the Muslims would change.
their names. Now, in the history, sometimes you will have Muslims, that the names that they'll be used in the history books many times would be their outer world name. Their, their, the name that they use within the community would not be used. So in our history books dealing with black history, there could be many Muslims who are actually Muslims, but they're using their slave name. Muslims will be known by their Muslim names within the community, but outside the community, um, they'd be known by um, a slave name. They were, they were like, for example, when, um, when uh, a, particular, a particular slave ran away, they would have, they put up two names, runaway slave, uh, who answer, goes by the name of Jeffrey, goes by the name of Jeffrey and Ibrahim. So in many instances, when the slaves would run away and there'll be signs put out, they would put both names. So one name for the outer world and one name for the community, that's one of the ways that they dealt with it. Another way that they dealt with it, of course, was like um, Job, Ben Solomon. They would just take their Muslim name, and if their Muslim name was a prophetic name, they would just anglicize it. So <clears throat> Ayub became Job. If your name was Yusuf, you became Joseph. You know, if your name was Musa, you became Moses. That was another way that it was done. But when Ayub bin uh, uh, Solomon went to back to Africa, then he went back to Ayub, even uh, uh, Suleiman. But he was known throughout, you know, when he made his appearances. You have to understand, brothers and sisters, when the slaveholders saw these Muslims, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but when the slaveholders saw these Muslims, brothers and sisters, back during that time, America was young, very young. So America was a, it was, a, it was a nation in which you can get by without reading and writing. Today, if somebody said they can't read or write, you say, what, you can't read or write? What? But there was a time in which that was the norm. Most people can't read and write. And if you can read or write, that was something special. Many of these slaves were coming over here literate. Literate. Knowing how to read and write Arabic. We'll get into that in a minute, inshallah. But the point I'm trying to make is that when Ayub uh, uh, ibn Suleiman, when they saw that he could read and write, and you know that in their mentality, Negroes can't read and write. Negroes are savages. That's why we have to enslave them for their own good, right? So they're reading and writing. And even sometimes their own slaveholders couldn't read and write. The majority of Americans couldn't read and write. And these so-called slaves are over here, and they're reading and writing. One slave kept the books for his slaveholder, and he did them all in Arabic. It kind of backfired on him because his slaveholder said, I, he, he, I ain't letting him go free. He's doing my books, you know. Arabic, I can't read my books. You know, that's how educated he was. But in their mind, these were savages coming out of Africa. But these so-called savages, there was an unusual proportion of professional people among the Muslim slaves. An unusual proportion of professionals, skills, but particularly reading and writing. And they dealt with that in different ways, and I'll deal with that in a minute. But the common technique, though, was to retain their names in the community. Some of their names became corrupted. Uh, Moro, Omar, Omar ibn Said, Omar. Omar became Moro or Moro, but that was actually Omar. So some of the names actually became corrupted. So again, in the history, some of the names that we're looking at, again, Muslim names that had been corrupted. But Omar ibn Said was called um, Moro and, um, and Moros. But in spite of all of this, sisters and brothers, listen to this. Muslim names can be found all over the Americas and the Caribbean. The records concerning the Maroons, we'll talk about the Maroons in a minute, inshallah, of Saint Domingue. For example, show the names, this is in the Caribbean, Ayub, Belali, Tamerlan, Halau, Ali, Suleiman, Lamin, Haida, Fatima, Yahya, Muhammad, Sule, Aluna, Sanim, Belal, Musa, Ali, Uthman, Abdullah are names that have been recorded in Brazil. Muhammad, Abu Barik, Abu Barika. Uh, Hamadi, Malik, Muhammadu, Abdullahi, um, Salhim, Muhammad, Muhammadu, Muhammadu were some of the Muslim names surviving in Trinidad. Jamaica had Abu Bakr, Haruna, 
Mohammed and Musa in French Louisiana. In French Louisiana, court records list Ahmad, El Mansour, Fatima, Yassin, Musa, Suman, Baraka, Memari, Marietta, Bakari, Bara, Salim, Musa, Alec, Abdullahi, Fatima, and Bilal. And Ismail appeared in Georgia. This is just an example of the names. Just an example. So all throughout the Americas, brothers and sisters, in the records of the name of slaves, the name of some of their children, and so on and so forth, they found all these Muslim names. So the Muslims retained their identity through the names. And they fought to retain their identity through their names. There is even speculation in Alan Austin's book, there is speculation, for example, that Bilal, Bilali, became Bailey. Bailey. And he speculates in his work that any African American whose last name is Bailey will most likely have Muslims in their background. Because that might be, he believes it's a corruption. Bilali, Bailey is a corruption of Bilali. Of Bilali. And he may have a point there. He may have a point. But all these names, all these different names were preserved. They were preserved. In spite of the fact, this is doing slavery, brothers and sisters. Doing slavery. So the Muslim slaves were keeping their traditional dress, trying to do what they can to keep their traditional dress. The more they were in the majority, the more closer they came to their traditional dress. The more they were in the majority. The only other place besides Nigeria that has the largest